We preserve a lot of the food that we grow. We pickle, we chutney, we dry. But the method that gets us the most questions is canning. So today, we're gonna to walk through the process of pressure canning. Hello, welcome to English Country Life. Welcome to the kitchen and welcome to the introduction to pressure canning. Canning is a massive subject and I could talk about it for hours. And if there's interest, we will go into a lot more detail in subsequent videos. But today is an overview and it's in about three parts. The first part is, well, why would you pressure can at all? Second part is how does a pressure can work? It's actually a glass jar in home use. It's not really one of those metal tins we're so familiar with. And thirdly, we'll walk you through the process. I made about 13 and a half litres of pumpkin spice soup yesterday, and we're gonna can that. Let's get started. Before we get going, let's define some terms. I'm gonna ask you to excuse the gas bubbling away in the background. We're actually heating things up here, ready to do some actual canning in a bit. When I talk about canning, I'm talking about this. This is a mason jar. It's a kind of glass jar that has an unusual lid. The lid itself is a flat thing that just sits on and it's held in place by a hollow band. And that allows it to do some special things and we'll show those in a bit. Now there's two kinds of canning. There's what's called water bath canning and what's called pressure canning. In water bath canning, what's in the jar has its own preservatives in. So you can water bath can jam or pickles. And in jam, it's the sugar that's acting as the preservative. In pickles, it's the vinegar. There's also pressure canning. And in pressure canning, the contents of the jar are superheated above 100 centigrade and sterilized in that way. The jar is then sealed and those sterile contents held in the jar. So in pressure canning, it's the process of pressure canning that preserves the food rather than the ingredients. So why do we pressure can? Well, certain foods, jams and jellies, are protected by sugar. Others, pickled onions, are protected by acid. There are other ways of preventing bacterial action, which is pretty much what causes food spoilage. You can lower the temperature till the bacteria become inactive, freezing. You can remove things that the bacteria want, water, so dry the food. But for some foods, we don't want to do any of that. So let's take an example of a chicken curry. We don't want to freeze it because we want it available to use very quickly. We may not have enough freezer space to freeze as much as we want. So, how do we protect it? Well, if we heat that food to above 80 centigrade, it will kill bacteria. Get it up to 100 to be sure. And by the way, when you say get something up to 100 centigrade, you need to get the middle of big chunks of meat up to 100 centigrade. So you have to keep it at that temperature for a decent amount of time. And that's great. Our problem, our fly in the ointment, is a particular form of bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. If you've ever heard of a nasty form of food poisoning called botulism, that's what causes it. And it causes it through a toxin. So what actually happens is it gives off a toxin in the food and unfortunately that toxin is odourless, tasteless, not visually apparent. So it can create that and it loves being in a jar because it likes an anaerobic, oxygen-free environment. It creates the toxin, you eat the food, you can't taste it and it gives you a nasty form of food poisoning. Fortunately, heating it up above 80 centigrade not only kills the bacteria, but it also breaks down the toxin, which is great. The real problem is it reproduces via a thing called spores. And those spores are resistant to heat. They will not die even if held at 100 centigrade. And that's as hot as you can get boiling water. So to sterilize that food, you have to get it to 121 centigrade. You can't do that in water. You can do that in steam. So what we do, we put the food in the jar, loosely put a lid on, put it into a pressure canner, which superheats the steam inside, gets it above 121 centigrade. We then keep it there till the middle of the food 
is above that temperature, that not only kills bacteria, breaks down any existing toxins, but it kills the spores. And provided that jar is then sealed before it leaves the sterile environment, it cannot be reinfected with botulism. And that's why pressure canning is brilliant. You can then leave that jar at room temperature for years on end and the food stays good. So that's why we pressure can. It basically allows us to store food that isn't inherently safe from bacterial action. It sterilizes that food, seals it, and allows us to keep it at room temperature for potentially years on end. What I want to do next is just show you how a mason jar actually works. I'm going to show you how a pressure canner works, and then we're going to do some canning. This is the three parts of a mason jar system. The jar itself is a heavy glass jar with a coarse thread at the top. The lid is simply a flat piece of metal that sits on top. What you'll notice if you look at the bottom is an orangey brown ring around the edge. And it's actually around the part that sits on the rim of the jar. And that orangey brown part is a thermal setting glue and it will stick that lid to that rim during the canning process. The third part is the band and that is put on loosely so you can notice that my hand slipping here I'm just tightening that till it feels resistance and there's a reason for that. I want you to listen to this. The lid can bulge up or bulge down. And during canning, the contents will heat and that will give off steam and the steam forces its way out from under the lid. When you finish canning and the jar is cooling, what will happen because the glue has stuck the lid down, there's almost a vacuum here and that lid will be sucked in and that holds the lid in place. And once the jar is fully cool, you can remove the band and at any point you want to test it, you can simply lift it up by that lid. And because it's going to have glued itself to the jar, you can check the seal. And even pressing it, you shouldn't be able to do this because it'll be sucked down. So you'll actually press it and it will be firm. So you can test that the contents of the jar have remained sealed. And as you lift this lid off for use, you will hear a hiss as air rushes under the lid. It's a very clever system. This is a pressure canner. For UK viewers, it's a great big pressure cooker. It has a few features that let it work. All we're gonna do is we're gonna put a bit of water at the bottom pan inch and we'll heat the pressure canner up and that water will give off steam. But we will use these clamps to prevent that steam escaping and the contained steam inside the pressure cooker can be heated above 100 centigrade. That will increase pressure and we have here a little weight valve that says 10, 15 and 5. You can put it on various settings and that controls how much the pressure builds up inside the canner. You can also monitor that on this gauge. The gauge is almost more useful for when you turn off the heat because when the needle drops back to zero you can tell that there is no pressure and it's safe to release the lid. Finally there's a safety valve at the back here, a little black button that will blow out if for any reason the pressure gets too high. But this will just jiggle anyway. Because it's loose, it just jiggles and vents excess steam if you've got the heat up too high. And with six clamps, the whole thing's a massive piece of cast aluminium. It cannot possibly blow. I know we've all got stories of our granny who with old fashioned pressure cookers <laughs> managed to cause all sorts of mayhem and get beef stew on the kitchen ceiling. It's just not gonna happen with one of these. In a minute, we'll start pressure canning. I just want to show you this first because this is a vitally important thing if you really want to try canning. This is the amusingly named 
Balls Blue Book. And we'll have no giggling from the cheap seats, please. It's a great book and was often known as the Canning Bible. You can see how tatty and worn my copy is. And in it, it contains two really great things. It contains step-by-step -step canning instructions. And even more importantly, individual recipes that tell you how long to can each recipe for, how much pressure to use, whether to pressure can, whether to water bath can. And these recipes are tested and safe. And there are lots and lots and lots of them and great instructions to go with them. For a long time, that was the book you went to. You'll hear people talk about the Balls Blue Book. However, there's also this. Ball's Complete Book of Home Preserving. I love it. Same sort of thing. We'll give you all the instructions of how to can. It will also walk you through the process in even more detail than the Ball's Blue Book. And because it's a much bigger book, you've got lots and lots of recipes that, again, will tell you how long to cook for, whether to pressure can, whether to water bath can, and how much pressure to use if you are pressure canning. If you're going to pressure can, and honestly, even if you're going to water bath can, get a copy of this book. I'll put a link in the description. Thanks for your patience. I hope those explanations made sense to you and they were worthwhile. I think it's important to know how the jars work, how the canners work, how to find the recipes, how to be sure that you're canning for the right amount of time and at the right pressure. And we know that now, we've shown it. Today we're going to use a canning method called hot packing. And what that means is we're packing hot food into hot jars. We'll walk through the process. Honestly, it's pretty straightforward. Before we start canning, we need to soften that thermal setting glue on the lids. So how we do that is we put them in a pan of hot but not boiling water for about 10 minutes. Here we are then, ready for hot pack canning. Now, the thing with canning is the process of canning takes time. And honestly, to do one or two jars, I don't find it's worth it. You've got to do a lot of jars to make it worthwhile. Hence our great big pantry full of jars. My canner holds 16 500 milliliter or pint jars in two rows. And I'll show you the rows in a minute. That means I have to be able to sterilise 16 pint jars at a time. You can just do that in a 23 litre saucepan. So that saucepan contains boiling water and 16 clean 500 milliliter mason jars. This saucepan contains 13 and a half litres of pumpkin soup that I made yesterday and it's hot. So the next process is to pack the hot soup in the hot jars. So our first challenge now is to get some jars out of a great big pan full of boiling water. And for that, tongs are your friend. And I find if you put the tongs into the mouth of the jar, you can easily empty the water, pop them onto a chopping board or another heat proof surface, and you're ready to go. Always take two at a time. And I'll show you why as we start packing the jars. I like to position my jars, as I say, on a board close to whatever food I'm trying to pack. I like to use a jam funnel on top of the jar because otherwise I'll make a mess. What I then do is label, label, ladle the soup or stew or curry or whatever we're canning into the jar. Now, you don't want to fill the jar all the way to the top. They talk about a notion of headspace here. Let me move the funnel. That's why I have two jars, so I can always move it on to the next jar. You want at least an inch at the top of the jar here for that steam that we talked about to build up, come out under the lid, create a vacuum. If you fill it too close 
to the top, you're going to get boiling liquid splurting up, getting onto the neck, and the jar won't seal properly. Before we put the lid on, we give the neck of the jar a little wipe, just in case any soup has fallen onto the neck of the jar. And if it has, it'll stop the glue of the lid sticking. So it's important that that neck is really clean. Then we take our lid out of the hot water, pop it on, and just lightly tighten down the band. Don't screw it down hard, remember, just lightly finger tighten. With the lid and band on properly, you can use jar lifter tongs to transfer the hot jar to the canner. This is the canner. You can see it's got a disc in the bottom that just holds the base of the jars off the base of the canner and ensures they're only heated by water or steam. And we can pop our jars onto that disc so that they don't touch each other or the side wall and I can get eight in a row and I can get two rows deep. And there is a layer of eight jars in the bottom of the canner and if I put a little ring on top of them I can stack another eight jars on top. That's another row of eight in for a sixteen in total. Time to get the lid on and start canning. You can see a little arrow here and a bigger one there. The lid locks in place and you can tell it's in the right location because the two arrows line up completely. Then we do up the clamps and we do them up a pair on opposite sides at a time because with this canner it's very important that the lid stays level to seal properly. So we've got the lid on. What I want you to notice is this spigot. That's where the weight sits for canning. Before we start the canning process, I'm going to turn the gas on and I'm going to fill the canner with steam. I'm going to look for the steam coming out of the nozzle and then I'm going to wait another 10 minutes to make sure that steam has replaced air in the canner because we can superheat that steam. We can't superheat air. So I'm going to get it steaming and then vent steam for 10 minutes. I put a black book behind so you can see the steam. So that's now up to temperature. We'll give it 10 minutes and then the canner's full of steam. We've had 10 minutes of venting steam now. I need to put the weight on. And my recipe calls for canning at 10 pounds of pressure for 55 minutes. So I'll put the number 10 onto the spigot. And we will wait until the pressure gauge shows there are 10 pounds of pressure inside the canner and we will then keep it there for 55 minutes. It's important to note that you do have to adjust your weights etc if you are at great height and the books will tell you how to do that because obviously atmospheric pressure varies if you're at altitude. The gauge is just right, 10 pounds of pressure. And our weight, you can probably just see, is letting a little bit of steam through. And that's because we're still heating it and it's going slightly over pressure. And I'm actually showing you the safety mechanism now. It's vented enough steam, it's dropped back to 10 pounds of pressure. I'll turn the gas down a bit now. And we want to just keep it that it jiggles like that just occasionally. And that's showing us that it's holding 10 pounds of pressure inside the canner. We've hit the 55 minutes. We'll turn the gas off. And turn the annoying alarm off. And we'll do nothing now until the pressure gauge drops to zero. Once it drops to zero, it's safe to remove the weight to vent any remaining steam. And then undo the clamps and remove the lid. Pressure's dropped to zero now. We've released the clamps and we can take off the lid. Now all we need to do is lift out those jars with the same jar lifter, let them cool. That clip 
click you just heard is one of the lids being sucked in by a vacuum and if it hadn't sealed well it wouldn't be able to be sucked in like that so you're really looking for the ping as it's described more of a click and there's another of the lids being sucked in and showing their sealing correctly the bubbling you can hear in the background now is the second batch of soup canning away this batch I've labelled and I'll leave the rings on only until they're completely cool and I'll take the rings off you don't want to leave them on long term they'll rust in place and make the soup very hard to open once they've begun to cool you can start checking this may look stupid but I know one's failed or at least I believe it has you hear that click that means it didn't suck the lid in now that may just be that it's not completely cooled but I'm keeping an eye on this one and if it doesn't seal when it's cooled you know what I'll do I'll pop it in the fridge and I'll have it for lunch tomorrow it's not exactly a disaster well can is full of batch two batch one is cooling on the side behind me we'll get about 28 pint jars out of that so that's 28 good lunches for me over the winter canning is a fabulous activity if you can find the time and if you've got the amount of produce you produce yourself to preserve and i don't just mean because it saves money i do a lot of things that are worth doing when i do them in bulk good example i make my own curry sauce and my own sweet and sour sauce from scratch it's hardly worth doing for a single meal you do enough for 20 meals and then preserve it so it's instantly available and can be on the table in 15 minutes suddenly it's a game changer it really really is now today we've only shown the very basic overview of pressure canning i'm really trying to pitch that for people who are just unfamiliar with canning they've heard of it but they really didn't know what to expect and for you i hope that's given you an overview of what it is why it's effective and the steps we go through to do it if you want to see more please leave us a comment there's a massive amount more we can cover we can talk about water bar canning cold packing all sorts of different jar types and sizes and different approaches to canning they all work they're all slightly different and they're great they're fun it's good to do if you've enjoyed this content can you spare us five seconds please give us a thumbs up down below leave us a comment or share the video even better we will be doing a lot more on preserving on produce and a lot of workshop stuff coming up over the winter as well if you'd like to see that hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell next to it and you'll hear every time we upload a new video whatever you do come back and see us soon take care